<coughs> Please, would you mind paying attention? So let's let's start with the basics. And uh, <coughs> so let me just remind you. So something we know in uh, gauge theories. When we talk about uh, breaking of uh, gauge theories, uh, <coughs> what is it that we say? Excuse me, cannot concentrate with your talk. So, so <coughs> when we talk, we talk about supersymmetry, uh, about symmetry breaking in gauge theories, what is it that we do? Is that we, we have a field phi transforming as a <coughs> e to the i. Alpha A T A I J Phi J such that uh, delta phi I is equal to I alpha A T A I J Phi J and uh, symmetry is broken. if delta phi i is different from zero in the vacuum. Okay, so that means that, that the, in the vacuum, the, the, poten the, the field is not invariant under the transformation. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> Delta phi i is different from zero in the vacuum. So or a way to say it, or a way to say it is that the phi alpha a t a i j times phi j on the vacuum equal to zero. Uh, uh, different from zero, sorry. And then that's a way to say, uh, we say that in this sense that, that uh, the vacuum is not annihilated by the corresponding symmetry generators, but the generators of the corresponding symmetry group, they do not annihilate the vacuum. If they annihilate the vacuum, the symmetry is preserved. If they do not annihilate the vacuum, the symmetry is broken. And uh, again, the, the typical example is uh, for a U1 case, we have <coughs> Phi equals rho e to the i theta. Therefore, delta phi <coughs> equals <coughs> delta phi equals i alpha phi. This implies that delta rho equal to zero and delta theta is different from zero is equal to alpha. And uh, this is the typical thing that you already have seen several times when you have a, a potential like this. And then theta is the angle, and the angle is the thing that is, uh, is not invariant under the transformation. Rho is the modulus, which is invariant. So then any, 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 any transformation will be just changing the angle theta. And that means that you have this flat direction, and theta is a massless field uh, corresponding to what is called a Goldstone boson. OK? So this is <coughs> what we all already know. And I'm just reviewing this to make the comparison when we discuss the case of supersymmetry. OK. So now let's do supersymmetry on this. Uh, so with sub C, so that we have that the supersymmetry is broken. And this is usually written like, uh, like that. Supersymmetry broken if <coughs> Q alpha 
the supersymmetry generators, annihilate the vacuum. Uh, do, uh, sorry, do not annihilate the vacuum. So if a Q alpha vacuum is different from zero, it's precisely in the same spirit that this, that the vacuum is not invariant under the corresponding transformation. So the, the generators acting on the vacuum is different from zero. So here the same thing. The generators acting on the vacuum is different from zero. So this is what, uh, what we will have when supersymmetry is broken. So let's see well, if we can say something general about supersymmetry breaking by knowing that this is the definition of, uh, of when the supersymmetry is broken. Any questions? Do you know, understand what, do you understand what uh, I'm talking about? Yep. So let's consider the following. As usual, we start with the, all this discussion is global n equals to one supersymmetry. So we start with the, the commutation relations Q alpha, Q bar, beta dot equals to two sigma mu, alpha mu, P mu. And let's multiply this on both sides by sigma nu and take the trace over the, over the um, indices alpha and, and beta dots. So that means that we have multiply by sigma, let's multiply by sigma bar nu <coughs> beta dot alpha acting on this equals two sigma bar nu sigma mu p mu. And this product you already know it by heart because it was I asked you in the first uh, example sheet to derive what it is. And that is, uh, uh, someone remembers? Eta mu nu. Eta mu yes. So it's a two there, so that means that will give you four eta mu nu, p nu, and this is equals to four p nu. Okay. So we have this nice identity that this sigma bar times the anti-commutator gives us only four times p nu once we trace over all the two-dimensional indices. So now let's take nu equal to zero. And uh, this implies that we have, we have here sigma bar zero. But sigma bar zero is just the identity, and we are taking the trace, so this is equal to just, sorry, just uh, Q alpha, Q dagger, alpha dot plus, sorry, Q, Q dagger alpha plus Q dagger alpha. And that equals to four times P zero. <clears throat> this one up, yes, sure. Yes. Okay. And four times P zero, P zero is just the energy, so just four times the energy. Okay, so this is a. What's the relationship between Q bar and Q dagger? Uh, precisely as I'm written there. Uh, remember that we are just summing over all the indices. Q bar alpha dot is equal to Q dagger alpha. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So this, this is telling us something. And so let, let me just see what is it that we can get. First of all, this implies two things. One, 
is that you can see already that uh, this left hand side is just the square, the modulus of the square of something. So acting on any state, that will give us something which is the energy of that state. And since this is a, the square, the, uh, something times something dagger, so this is a, a positive. And so this is telling us that for any state, this is, this is uh, for any state, we have a result that the energy is positive or zero. Something we had seen before. Remember when we were discussing the potentials in, in global supersymmetry, we found that, this, that the potentials were always, always semi-positive definite. And here you can see from the algebra itself that this is uh, generally the case, that the energy is positive or zero. Okay, so that's first implication. This is a very general result, just using the n equals to one supersymmetry algebra. And uh, this manipulation is similar to the manipulation we did when, when we discussed the BPS states. But this is simpler because it's only n equals to one supersymmetry, so we didn't have to do all, 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 all the complicated uh, arguments. This is just the, the simplest thing, and we get that there is a bound that the energy has to be positive or zero. Now, the second implication we can write about this is that now we can sandwich this, this uh, object with, the, with a vacuum state. So we have vacuum, Q alpha, Q alpha dagger, plus Q alpha dagger, Q alpha, acting on vacuum. And that is, <coughs> that is the energy of the vacuum, but whatever it is, it's positive definite. Okay. So now look at what we have in the first line over there. We have that supersymmetry is broken if the condition Q alpha acting on vacuum is different from zero. Okay, so now we have to see what does this uh, tell us about supersymmetry breaking. <clears throat> so what this tells us is that supersymmetry is broken, is equivalent to have the energy strictly positive. Okay. The reason is like because we know that Q alpha does not annihilate the vacuum. So this thing is, is non-zero. And we know this positive or zero, since supersymmetry is broken. This, this cannot be zero. So the condition for having uh, broken supersymmetry is that the, just to see the energy. Just if the energy is zero, you may or not, uh, 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 do not break supersymmetry. But if the energy is positive, you break supersymmetry. Okay, so, that, that's, so the energy is the order parameter of supersymmetry breaking. In the same way that the, that the value of the scalar field here was the order parameter for the breaking of the gauge symmetry. So it's a different thing. So for gauge symmetries, is the value of the scalar field, is the VEF of the scalar field. For supersymmetry, is the value of the energy that tells you if, if supersymmetry is broken or not. OK. OK. Good. So that's a. Uh, and of course, well, supersymmetry is unbroken if and only if the energy is 0, just the other way around. OK. Good, so that finishes section 5.1, section 5.2, F and D breaking. So let's try to see all these general results, if we can uh, control them in a concrete uh, model. So, so we'll, we'll first discuss about um, the case of only chiral superfields, and then I will tell you that uh, the corresponding auxiliary field, F, will be the thing that breaks supersymmetry. So let, let me just 
first discover the cattle. So F term first. So we have a cattle superfield. We know, and we, uh, I think you have seen it already in, in several times, that the transformation of the supersymmetry of each of the components of the uh, Carroll superfield like this Okay, so we have a cattle superfield. We have a theory when we have a cattle superfields, and the question is, when is it uh, that we you, we can see from here that supersymmetry is broken? Remember that uh, saying that supersymmetry annihilates the vacuum is the analog of what I have here of uh, the expression over there, T acting on the vacuum, different from zero. Okay, uh, what I'm doing here will be closer to this, delta phi different from zero. So that's what I want. So it's delta of, of each of the, of, of the superfield, if it is different from zero, we know that supersymmetry will be broken. Okay? So that means that we, look, we have to look on the vacuum if uh, the right-hand side can be different from zero. If anything on the right-hand side can be different from zero on the vacuum, then we break supersymmetry. Okay? But on the vacuum, what, what is it that, 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 that uh, can get expectation values that, uh, that we know? Have you ever seen a scalar getting an expectation value? Yes. A scalar getting an expectation value is a typical case like this, because they have the expectation value in the vacuum of a scalar. But what about the fermion? Can a fermion get a vacuum expectation value? What happens if you, if, if, yes? The problem is allowance Exactly, very good. So we cannot have a fremion, in this, in this case psi, having a VEV, because if you have a fremion with a vacuum expectation value, that means since it transforms on the Lorentz transformation, it will break also Lorentz invariance. So you cannot have psi getting a VEV. So this right hand side here has to be zero on the vacuum. Okay. The same thing. Here, because you have deep psi, if psi cannot be zero, deep psi cannot be zero. Um, cannot be different from zero, I'm sorry. Cannot be different from zero, because otherwise this will also uh, break Lorentz invariance. What about this term? This term, phi can get a vacuum expectation value, but d phi cannot, because d phi is like a vector, so a vector cannot be, again, different from zero on the vacuum because it will break Lorentz invariance. So the only thing that can get a VEV is a scalar. And uh, if phi gets a VEV, that doesn't matter because phi only appears with a derivative here. So the only term that can be different from zero is, is this one. F can be different from zero without breaking Lorentz invariance. Okay. So we know that psi For Lorentz invariance, so that means that the only way to get something different from zero on the right-hand side is to have f different from zero. So. If the vacuum expectation value of f is different from zero. Probably, uh, I told you before, you, you're not uh, confused when I say vacuum expectation value. It's like sandwiches on the vacuum. It's the value of the field on the vacuum. That's, that's vacuum expectation value. This, of the field is, 
<coughs> okay, so this is the way of breaking supersymmetry. You have the, the F field gets an uh, expectation value different from zero. It can break supersymmetry because then the right hand side will be different from zero. And uh, but Lorentz invariance will still be preserved. But notice that it's not everything that transforms uh, that will get be different from zero. For this, you will have delta phi will be equal to zero, and delta f will be equal to zero. So it's only delta psi that will transform, and delta psi will be proportional to root two epsilon times f on the vacuum, and this would be the thing that will be different from zero. Okay. So now look at what we had in the in the abelian case of gauge theory. We had here rho was invariant, and it was only theta that transformed. Okay, so it was the angle, and this theta corresponded to to a field, a particular field that is called a Goldstone boson. Is the thing that is is the object that is not invariant under the symmetry, and in this case corresponds to a particle of mass zero. And it's called a boson, Goldstone boson because it is a boson. It is always a scalar. Here, what we will have is everything, the, the other uh, phi and f, the scalar components, they do not transform. But it's, it is a fermion that transforms. Okay. And because of that analogy, so this is called psi, it's called a, a Goldstone fermion. But more often, it's actually referred to as the Goldstino. Okay, okay so probably Goldstone doesn't mind, but <laughs> okay, so it's the Goldstino. Notice a typical mistake that people make is that people think that the Goldstino could be a supersymmetry partner of a Goldstone boson, and that is not true. Goldstino is the fermion for which it transforms. They, it may or may not be. A, Partner of a Goldstone boson, but uh, for supersymmetry, the only thing that Goldstone has to be is just the f is the corresponding f is the fermion that transforms non-trivially on the supersymmetry. Okay, so expectation value of is yes. Okay. So, so this is it. This, this is a. Uh, uh, remember, I'm just talking about the, the Carroll's field. So it's only the f term that uh, that gives you a a uh, breaking of, the, of supersymmetry. Then we'll mention later on the d term breaking. Okay. <coughs> so. <coughs> for this, we can recall. Remember, when we were constructing the, the, the corresponding um, Lagrangian, we had found that, that the F term of the scalar potential was equal to K inverse IJ star uh, dW d phi i dW star d phi star j, and this was itself proportional to f f star. You remember? You remember how we derive? Remember when, when I derived the scalar potential? I just solved the equation for f. And f was proportional to, to dW phi. Then I substitute for f and found the potential to be just dW phi. So, but the potential itself was proportional to f, it's f star. Okay. So now it is interesting that in the vacuum, and what I'm telling you is that f would be different from zero. Okay. And the potential is positive definite, 
semi-positive definite, but on the vacuum, we know that it has to be positive, never zero, if you break supersymmetry. If f is different from zero, the potential will be different from zero, that will be positive. Okay. So this implies that SUSI is broken, if and only if, in this case, it's just strictly positive. Okay, so let, let's consider shapes of, of, of uh, potentials and we'll see how, just to get a, a, a feeling of how, how to recognize when supersymmetry is broken or not. So, examples. Potential like this. V against phi. This potential doesn't break anything. So, for this, the value of phi in the vacuum, the minimum of the potential, is zero, and the value of the potential in the minimum is also zero. So this implies that uh, if there is a gauge symmetry, so it's gauge symmetric, and supersymmetric. Potential like this, breaks gauge symmetry because phi is different from zero in the vacuum, but the potential is still zero in the vacuum. So this, it is supersymmetric and uh, gauge symmetry is broken. Potential like uh, this one you can see that phi equals to zero but V is different from zero and it's actually positive. So that means that it is is gauge symmetric but supersymmetry is broken. And of course the last possibility is to have both being broken, so that you have that phi is different from zero, and also the energy is different from zero, so both gauge and supersymmetry are broken. Okay, so this is a way to see when you see a potential in global supersymmetry, you can just see already when supersymmetry will be broken or not. It's very easy. You see if the minimum is positive, it's broken. If the minimum is at zero energy, it's, uh, it's unbroken. Okay. So let me just do an example. Of a co concrete model where you can see that supersymmetry is broken. So the question is, how do we get, in a concrete model, an expectation value for f different from zero? So an example would be what is called the O'Rafferty model. The question is just to, to devise a concrete superpotential such that you can get the expectation value of f different from zero. And for that, you need at least three superfields. So you need three superfields, phi 1, phi 2, and phi 3. 
And uh, for simplicity, you take the carrier potential to be the, the canonical one. So just phi i dagger phi i. But then we'll take the superpotential as follows. And I will assume that n is much greater than little m. So these are two parameters, together with g, it's a third parameter. But uh, this will be uh, something very heavy multiplying, uh, that's uh, coming from capital M, and little m is smaller than m. <coughs> so. So for this, let's see how we can get f different from 0. Well, let's compute f. f, remember, it was, it's the w phi, essentially. So we can just compute f, oh, essentially, what is minus the w phi. So F1 star will be dW d phi 1, and this equals to g phi 3 square minus m square, minus F2 star equals dW d phi 2, and this equals to m times phi 3, you just see it over there, and minus F3 star equals dW d phi 3 and dw d phi 3 you have a 2g phi 2g phi 1 phi 3 plus m phi 2 i'm sorry i'm doing the i'm mixing the two things i'm mixing the two the little phi's and the capital phi so let me just keep it with the little phi's 2 phi 1 phi 3 plus m phi 2 I'm doing what I told you usually is done in terms of, you know, superpotential is written in terms of the superfields. When you take derivatives, this is derivative with respect to the component, the scalar component of the superfield. So what we want to have is at least one of these three f's to be different from zero. If we achieve that, then we break supersymmetry. It is as simple as that. And that means so the, the trick is very simple. You just take, computer, take the superpotential, take derivatives, and look for the right-hand side and see if we can achieve uh, at least one of, those, of, of the three to be different from zero, and that would break supersymmetry. So the important thing is that uh, you have to, to cook a good superpotential to do that, and that's why Rafferty did and got uh, uh, his name out of this model, is because uh, it, it you, start, you write just the simplest model, like uh, the Wesley model, you, don't, you, will not, you will find solutions for these equations equal to zero, and then that means that, that you will not break supersymmetry. The, question, the thing that you have to do is to combine the, the, the coupling such that these equations cannot be solved sim, uh, simultaneously. The, 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 each of them equal to zero will be inconsistent. So that, that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's, that's, that's what you have to find. For instance, if you set this equal to zero, that will tell you that phi 3 equals to m, essentially. But, but if you set that equal to zero, that will tell you that phi 3 is 0. But we know that m is different from 0. So these two cannot be simultaneously equal to 0 if m, of course, is different from 0. OK? So you cannot satisfy, cannot, cannot have simultaneously f1 equals to f2 equals to f3 equal to 0. So that means that at least one of them will be different from 0. And that means that supersymmetry is broken. OK? Good. So let me exploit this model a bit more.
So for this, uh, let me just find the spectrum. And uh, <clears throat> for this, I have to find the potential. The potential in this case is just W B, uh, B equals dW d phi i square, because the killer potential is just it's just the canonical one. So the, the second derivative of the killer potential is just the identity matrix. So <clears throat> V is like, is like that. And then it just is the sum of the squares of those three terms. So this will be equal to g square, phi t square minus m square square plus m square phi 3 square plus 2g phi 1 phi 3 to square. <clears throat> So you can see that, uh, well, if m squared is smaller than m squared, capital M squared over 2g squared, as I, we have assumed, because capital M is much bigger than little m, the minimum of this potential is at the point phi 2 equals to phi 3 equal to 0. So you can see the sum of positive terms. <clears throat> so this will be minimized by phi 3 equal to 0. This will have phi 2 equal to 0, but then uh, phi 1 can be arbitrary. Okay, because if we set phi 3 equal to 0, then there's no dependence on phi 1. So phi 1 can take any value. This is a good example of something that is called a, a modulus. That means that it's a, you have a potential, when, when it has a flat direction, a completely flat direction, then that is, this direction is called a, a modulus field. So if there are several of them, there are moduli fields. And uh, they, they are very common, for instance, uh, in many supersymmetric theories, because you have flat directions, they stay flat perturbatively because the superpotential doesn't get corrected. Uh, and also in string theory, the moduli fields appear very, very often. The size and shape of the extra dimensions and so on, they are moduli fields. So in this case, the potential is, like, is uh, well, you can take it to be a shape like this. And so this is the flat direction which is called the modulus. OK. And in particular, being a completely flat direction, what can we say about the mass of phi 1? Any idea? 0. Being a flat direction, the mass is the curvature of the potential. If it is not curved, the, potential, the mass is 0. Okay. OK. <clears throat> so to compute the mass of the other, of the other, so phi 1 is massless. I will say like uh, m phi 1 equal to 0. And for to compute the mass of the, other, of the other two, for simplicity, I will just compute it in the case, in the point, in this modelized space, say, of phi equals to 0. So at. Uh, phi equal to 0 for simplicity, because of course phi can take any other value, I will calculate the, the, the masses of the other two fields. So, and, uh, sorry, uh, before saying that, I have to tell you that in this case, when I set phi 3 and phi 2 equal to 0, then the potential takes the form g squared m to the 4, isn't it? Because phi 3, phi 3, 0, phi 3, 0, phi 2, 0. Yes, it's like that. And you can see that it's positive. And then SUS is broken. That's as we wanted. Okay? So the value of the potential at the minimum, so let's take at the minimum, 
is just g squared m to the 4. And it's positive, so supersymmetry is broken. That's, that's. So we know supersymmetry is broken. And we know that there is this flat direction for phi 1. And at a particular point, phi 1 equal to 0, I will complete, compute then the masses of all the other particles. Which other particles we have? We have the other two scalars, phi 2 and phi 3, but we also have the fermions. So I want to see how the mass of all, all the particles uh, uh, behave. If they were supersymmetric, they will be all, all the fermions will be the same mass as the bosons. But if supersymmetry is broken, we may expect otherwise. Okay, so we have to see what is the mass of the fermions and what is the mass of the bosons. Massless. Okay. How do you define the mass when you have a field, say, with uh, canonical kinetic term? The mass of the field is 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 is, uh, is the term proportional to phi square in the potential. Okay. The, the the field has no potential. The potential is zero, so it's completely massless. So you can see, essentially, the mass is proportional to the, how curved the potential is in that direction, and it is not curved. It's zero. So this is an extreme massless case. It's massless and flat. So. so yeah. What the A? <laughs> Thanks, thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yes. At. Yes. At phi 1 equal to 0, for simplicity, we will compute the spectrum. Compute sp spectrum of fermions. And scalars. Okay, so let's start with the fermions. We know that the fermion masses are given in terms of the of the of the Yukawa couplings that I told you when we I, we discussed the renormalizable uh, supersymmetric Lagrangians, and they are given like that. Mass term. will be like this. If you remember, there was a second derivative of W with respect to phi i, phi j, times psi i, psi j. OK? So <clears throat> this, is, this was the Yukawa coupling we had in the, in, the, in the Lagrangian. And now, if I evaluate this part, the, the bosonic part, at the vacuum, what it, whatever is left there, it, it will be the mass for these fermions. So this is the mass matrix. The fermionic mass matrix is just the second derivative of the of the of the phi's. And we can compute that and get and get the, the masses. Uh, so this is a very concrete case. And we find that the uh, at this point of phi, phi 1 equals to 0 and the, and the other phi 2 is equal to 0, phi 2 and phi 3 equal to 0, the mass matrix for fermions looks very simple. Okay. So this implies we have the whole first row equal to 0, that means that means that the mass of psi 1 is 0. It's the first. And for psi 2 and psi 3, you have uh, this 2 by 2 matrix that you have to diagonalize. And uh, that will, since they, this, this, they are common entry m at the end, you will, have, you will see that m psi 2 equals to m psi 3 equals to capital M. You may find the eigenvalues of this matrix. One may be positive and the other one negative. But you can always, for a, for a fermion having a negative mass, you can always change it to positive by redefinition of the field. So at the end, the physical mass is m for both. So that's easy. We got now the mass of the fermions. So for scalars, we know already that, uh, that phi 1 was massless, so we have to find phi 2 and phi 3. In the meantime, look at this result here. Was this expected? The reason is yes, because it is 
psi 1, that will be our Goldstone particle. And remember that the Goldstone boson had to be a massless boson in the case of a broken gauge symmetry. In the case of a, of a supersymmetry, it would be the, the Goldstone fermion. And uh, so we have to we expect a particle, a fermion, to remain mass. This would be a general result, and it happens in this particular case. Furthermore, look at psi 1, look at f1. f1, in this minimum, f1 is the one that is different from 0, because phi 3 is 0. So f1 is the one different from 0, but f1 is how psi 1 transforms. So it's the corresponding field. Remember that delta psi 1 is the thing that is proportional to f, to f1. And this is the thing that's different from 0. So this, this implies that psi 1 is, the, is our Goldstein. Okay, so we have a concrete representation of the Goldstein. It's the field that is not invariant in the supersymmetry and happens to be massless. And this, this is a general result in the same way that the Goldstein boson, the massless boson in supersymmetry, is a general result that the Goldstein defined by this is also massless. Okay. For the scalars, we have to take, it's more complicated. If you have a potential, how do you find the masses of the scalars? How will you do it? Sorry? Take twice the derivative. Perfect, yes. Take the second derivative and look for, for the matrix of the second derivative of the potential. Look at different from the mass. The mass term for the fermions is the second derivative of the superpotential. The mass term for the scalars is just the standard thing as in non supersymmetric theory. Just take a potential and look for second derivatives of the potential. In particular, it's like looking for, for the masses of the corresponding um, particles. So, so you can make an expansion of the potential and pick the fields, the, the terms proportional to the phi squares, and that will be the masses. Okay. So, <clears throat> so I won't give you the tails, but for the, the quadratic piece of the potential takes this following form minus m square phi square phi three square plus phi three star square plus m square phi three square So we already know that uh, m phi 1 equal to 0. And from here, we can see that the mass of phi 2 equal to 0. I'm sorry, the mass of phi 2 equals to m. But for phi 3, it's complicated because it has the modulus here, but also the real and imaginary part. For just, so you have to, to diagonalize it in that regard. To the, yes? Is phi 1? Okay. Phi 1. Thank you. Sorry, I want to do it fast and then they make mistakes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. So one, since phi one doesn't appear here, as we knew because it's a flat direction, it should not appear. So in the, the mass of phi one is zero. The mass of phi two is n. So for phi three we have to do a, 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 a redefinition. So we can just call phi three equals a plus i b, and we can just plug it back. You can read. You can read that n of A equals capital M minus 2G M square, and MB equals capital M plus 2G M square. Sorry. Oops. Okay. So what is it that we have? This implies that the spectrum is as follows. We start here with mass equal to zero. Mass equal to zero.
And here we have two fields, phi1 and psi1. The Gostino and his partner, they are both massless. Then we have at mass equal to capital M, we have the field phi 2 and psi 2, they are both with capital M, so phi 2 and psi 2, they have mass capital M, as we had seen. And but also the field, the field, uh, I'm looking for the mass matrix yeah, here. Yes, the two fermions have mass capital M, so psi 2 has capital M, and then we, uh, we just already saw that phi 2 has mass capital M, but also psi 3 has mass capital M. However, for uh, the scalar components of, 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 of psi 3, being the, the real and imaginary part of phi 3, we have splitting. Okay, so this mass is uh, what I have just written there. So it's. Uh, yeah. Excuse me? Over there? Uh, let me see, we have to go back to the, here. And this lamp squared, G squared. Yes, and then you have this one. The, oh, you mean that the G has to be square? Uh, let me be sure. We can check that. Uh, it may be that I made a mistake. No, it's G square, probably G square. Yes, you're right. So you think that this should be square? Yeah. I think you're right. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So then this mass will be um, square root of uh, m square plus 2g square m square. And this is square root of m square minus 2g square m square. So you can see. Precisely, and and for this will be for phi for what, what, what I call uh, b and for a. Okay, so you can see explicitly that that this is this is the, the amount by which supersymmetry was broken. Okay, so now the psi three doesn't come with a, a bosonic partner, but it comes together with a, uh, the real and imaginary part of phi 3 is split it into two particles, one heavier and one lighter than the corresponding fermions. And uh, so, <clears throat> and the difference between the masses is proportional to this quantity, g square m square, okay, which is given, oh, sorry. Well, which is proportional to what you get from the from the v sub to a factor of g. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, <laughs> okay. So essentially, is that uh, is, this is different from zero. This will be this will give you the scale. Yes. Sorry. Better to say it. Look at at f one. I told you that f one is the thing that breaks supersymmetry. So I didn't erase it here, so we were lucky. So at the vacuum, phi three equal to zero. So f one was g times n square. Okay, so it, that is the thing that is different from zero, and that is essentially what is giving us the, the splitting here, except for the square here that I, for some reason, I'm missing. I'm missing the square here. Uh, perhaps uh, we need an m to the fourth. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the quadratic piece has the expansion. And, and m, no, it's m square. Probably I. I, I uh, yes. Um, My feeling is that I had, uh, let me see. Maybe F1 star is meant to be G squared as well. No. No, uh, sorry, I I'll, I'll check it next time. But uh, the, I'm missing a factor of uh, G squared over there. But essentially, essentially you can see that, that this is what is breaking 
supersymmetry. So but th this, this, th this amount is breaking supersymmetry, and that is what it essentially enters into the F1, up to the G, which is a, it's a constant, so it, that should not be a problem. But uh, this is uh, an, an explicit verification of how supersymmetry is broken in, in a concrete model. And, and by the way, that uh, this is the splitting of, of the multiples. This is very important because of um, experiments, eventually. You expect supersymmetry to be broken in the experiment. So what is it that you expect is to have this splitting of the multiples. And this splitting of the multiples is what we expect to be in the real world. If supersymmetry is, 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 is playing a role at low energies, this splitting of the multiples it should be of the order of the, uh, the TeV energy of, the, of LAC exploring. So what we have to see is that, that the particles, uh, the, for instance, the partner of the, if, if, if Psi 3 is, a, is a, an electron, we expect this electron to be a little bit heavier than, it, than, than this. And this, by this amount, should be of the order of the, of the TeV scale. So that's why in, in LAC we are looking for, for that, that uh, signature of supersymmetry breaking. That will be discovering particles which are a TeV heavier than the corresponding fermions. Okay, so that, that, that's how important it is. Of course, this is a toy model. We have to see how supersymmetry is actually broken in, 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 in realistic models, but uh, the idea of that splitting of the multiples is the fundamental thing, and finding this scale is, 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 is relevant. Sorry, I took five minutes out of your time.